Welcome to another video by Captain Radio Adventures, and this time this video is about NFED half-wave antennas with traps. And the question we're trying to answer here is, it's convenient to have a trap, but is it worth the convenience? Uh, how, what price are you paying for this convenience? And in the graphic of this page, I have a, an image of the summit of Grassy Ridge Bald in eastern North Carolina, where I was activating uh, Soda Summit, Summits on the Air Summit. And at that time, it was a very windy day, and the uh, winds were gusting upwards of 50 miles an hour with a steady uh, 30 miles an hour. And it became uh, rather uh, uh, unpleasant, if you will, to uh, get go up to the antenna and link something to make uh, a band happen or to effectively make put the band in play. So that's just some background on my use of trap antennas. Uh, so what is a trap antenna and what does it do? A trap is a parallel tuned circuit, an inductor in series with a capacitor that has a resonant frequency at this resonant frequency, it has, it has high impedance, essentially acting as a block at the frequency the trap is tuned to. Uh, below that resonant frequency, the reactance is inductive and allows the current to pass through and acts as a short. And above that resonant frequency, the current is blocked and it behaves as an open. So it's essentially behaving like a switch. However, there's an insertion loss associated with this trap, and uh, the question is how much, how much power is consumed in the trap and how it affects the real-world antenna performance, and hence the reason for this video. So I embarked in a side-by-side uh, -side battle between two, two antennas. Both are multiband antennas. Both are multiband and fed half waves. One enables operation of the 60 meter band with a link, which is antenna number one, and the other, antenna number two, enables operation on the 60 meter band with a trap. In the second instance, antenna number two, the operator does not need to do anything to enable the 60 meter band, and the transition is automatic. In the former, number one, number one antenna, the operator has to disconnect that link to, to operate on 40 meters and connect that link when he wants to operate on 60 meters. So here's the schematic of the antenna. There's a transformer one on one end, it's an end fed, and you have about roughly 66 feet of wire that forms the 40 meter half wave, and at the four meter half wave endpoint, there's either a link or a trap. And then there's a stub wire that's that extends the wire length to electrically the length of a half wave on 60 meters, uh, which is roughly 80 some feet. However, the coil shortens the, the stub wire to only 10 feet if it's a link half wave and eight feet if it's a trap half wave. Um, the inductance in the trap essentially shortens the physical length of the, ov the overall length of the antenna. So here's our test setup. I have a uh, two antenna setup at my QTH, one by the road denoted by the, the red line, the the red box is the transformer end, and uh, about 100 feet apart from it is a uh, that yellow line, which uh, indicates the the trap half wave, and the yellow box being indi indicating the the presence of a transformer at that end. They're both set up as inverted V's. Uh, that's about as close I can set up the azimuth or orientation of both antennas to be similar to each other. The apex is about 20 feet in both cases. 
and uh, both transmitters are up, are outputting 200 milliwatts and the, the test is supposed to last I made the test last only three hours the objectives of the test is to primarily the to get the performance effect on the 60 meter band during which current is flowing through the trap and also the performance effect on the 40 meter band when when the trap acts as an open now there on the link half wave there are two cases one when an operator forgets to unlink the link which is a results in a mismatch on 40 meters and when the link is disconnected which makes it a resonant half wave on 40 meters and there are two performance figures that can be gained by seeing what the difference is uh, this image is from google earth and uh, towards the top of the page is due north here's the test setup for antenna number one that um, green diamond with a toroid on it is the trap um, and on to the right of it is the stub wire for the 6 meter band 60 meter band um, and it has a um, and here's the setup of the transmitters uh, transmitters are um, whisper light transmitters um, outputting 200 milliwatts there are low pass filters that have to be set up uh, these low pass filters are uh, 40 60 and 80 meter low pass filters and uh, I would have to be conscious to set the jumpers to the appropriate band uh, and there's a power input conditioner which changes the input from the battery which is 12 volts to down to 5 volts and there's a lithium iron phosphate battery that's supplying the power to the transmitter here's the test setup for antenna number two and there's the 60 meter coil with the stub wire um, and uh, they're both using weatherproof transformers that I've made um, and these tests were conducted in the rain and here's the transmitter setup for antenna number two same deal um, whisper transmitter low pass filter power input conditioner and uh, lithium iron phosphate battery and here are the results for 60 meters after three hours and you can see the the red line is the link half wave and the blue line is the trap half wave it took a little bit of time before stations started hearing the trap half wave and it started catching up but it didn't quite catch up to the level of the link half wave so there's definitely a performance benefit to not having current flowing through the trap to enable the 60 meter band um, this plot is called the dx10 graph um, and the dx10 graph plots the 10 most distant stations looking back an hour so at any given point in time it tries to look back an hour and and averages the 10 most distant stations at that specific time and uh, here are the results in a table form um, the dx10 for the trap halfway which is the table above has four unique stations reporting with an average distance of roughly 260 kilometers and um, the link half wave has seven stations uh, unique stations reporting a total of uh, 66 spots um, and the average distance is 430 kilometers is the correct unit there so I have my units mixed uh, believe the table uh, not the annotation at the bottom it's 265 kilometers and 430 kilometers and there's a feature uh, supplied by the dxplorer software by which 
one can get the reports from simultaneous spots uh, from stations that are reporting both signal, both transmitters, having received signals from both transmitters, and comparing the signal to noise ratio from from both transmitters. And here the results are are mixed. Some stations are reporting the signal from the trap halfway, the VOI to AJ transmitter to be stronger and uh, the other stations um, reporting the link half wave being stronger. Um, I think one would have to put the weight on the averages uh, as because there are more results that lend credence to the link half wave being more uh, having a, a stronger signal. And here's a graphic of where these stations are on a great circle map. One is as far as New York. And I think um, the one on the blue, the blue line to the left is somewhere in the Ohio Valley. And the antenna being um, near, uh, near vertical incident sky wave, the contacts are rather short. Now let's look at the results on 40 meters. And um, I ran the, this test for six hours after I realized after three hours that I forgot to unlink uh, the link that makes 40 meters a half wave. And so I was transmitting with high SWR on 40 meters with a, with a wire that's the length of for, that's appropriate for a 60 meter band. Um, I Looking back, look, looked at the SWR, and the SWR was 8.5, and the SWR, SWR was 8.5, and I had a, a, a bad mismatch. Yet I was getting a signal out and getting stations to report signals coming from the link half wave. The trap half wave, which is the blue line, was uh, steadily um, uh, sending trend signals to those receiving stations and the receiving stations were uh, near constant uh, 500 kilometers or so and so um, in the middle of the graph which is the end of the first three hours i i disconnect i disconnected the link to make it a half wave 140 meters and immediately the the performance on the link half wave improved um, what I also did at the same time when I disconnected um, the link, um, I also swapped transmitters. So the link half wave was in red before on the first three hours. In the last three hours, the link half wave is in blue and the trap half wave is in red. So the SWR mismatch reduced the performance of the link half wave because it was transmitting on too long a wire um, to be appropriate for 40 meters. And the performance was restored, equalized after I, after I um, disconnected the link. Uh, the performance after I disconnected the link favored the link halfway by a little bit. And um, here's a zoom for the last three hours with link half wave slightly higher than the trap half wave. And the SWR in both cases are about the same. We will have to look at the simultaneous spot feature to evaluate this marginal performance gain on the link half wave. On the surface, they are about equal. And so the report from the simultaneous spot feature uh, shows a bell-shaped distribution. Had it been centered around zero dB, one would say that the performance are about the same. But since the, the distribution is centered around 2.4 dB, um, it was favoring the link half wave by that much. And uh, in signal to noise ratio language, 6 dB is 2x better. Um, this is to differentiate itself from the 3 dB is 2x better in power terms. Um, in this case, the link half wave is only about 12% better. 
um, and um, the effect of that 12% improvement is, is quite small. The average distance reported by the link half wave is only 200 kilometers longer than, uh, than the trap half wave. Both transmitters were getting signals received by stations that averaged over 7,000 kilometers. And here's a plot of the of the stations that are receiving the signals from both these transmitters on a great circle map. And conclusions, uh, operators would consider the performance degradation a worthwhile price to pay, I think, um, because you are getting true plug and play operation. You're still going to make contacts with slightly degraded performance. So there was one camp that would say, yes, it's worth it. There might be another camp that say it's not worth it and would rather get maximum performance and go through the effort of uh, uh, getting up and unlinking for 40 meter operation and below. Um, the price for laziness in not disconnecting the link is significant. So you're getting only about half the distance because of the high SWR, and uh, you're also risking damage to your transmitter because of the high SWR. I also discovered that the, the Whisper Light transmitter is rugged enough to have re withstood a reflected power of 112 milliwatts based on my calculations from the SWR of 8.5, and the guidance from the manufacturer is limited to less than 100 milliwatts, and I was fortunate not to damage the transmitter, and uh, I guess I consider myself lucky. Um, on the penalty uh, on the frequencies um, on 40 meters, which is the trap frequency, and uh, higher, which is like 20 meters, is, is rather small as shown by the data. So I think uh, you can come to your own conclusion as to what this means for you and uh, you can put any comments in the comments below for this video. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.